Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, accompanied by General James D. Hittel. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this dedication of the rebuilt Army and Navy Club. At this time, the Reverend Thomas J. Sh Lord God, Master of the Universe, when seen guests at every meal, we thank you for this facility, and today we invoke your blessing on it. Fill the leisure time of all who come here with newness. May this be a place of healing and helping, resting and singing, as well as eating and drinking. May it open people to each other, may it intensify relationships, create worthwhile conversation. And strengthen and renew all the members by what they do by what they say and by what they celebrate. Make their lives more festive. May this facility be a home at the end of exile, peace at the end of war, rain at the end of drought, a song at the end of sorrow, and a harvest at the end of hunger, a home after home. Let all who come here be not unmindful of tables that are empty, cupboards that are bare. And as this club opens its doors to greet the future, may its members help to give meaning to history. Make them all instruments of your peace. Mr. President, clergy, members, and friends. Mr. President, we regret the inconvenience of uh, Friday's snowstorm and the uh, uh, difficulty it undoubtedly caused you in rescheduling uh, to dedicate our new home. And as you well know, this third time is a very special one. For too long, the issue was in doubt as we faced the dreaded possible call at home base of three times and out. But of course, this dedication and open house proves that we made it. And we made it because of the members' loyal support, because of the endless and able efforts of our Vice President, General Donald Dawson, the devotion of our General Manager, Charles Graham, and special tribute to. Also goes to the members of the Board of Governors, who throughout the rebuilding so ably supported the project. And also, we do want to recognize Mr. John DeVette and Mr. Stephen Wingate of London, who had the vision and the courage to make this pace-setting project really come true. And I'm glad to report to you that this Army and Navy Club is not only surviving, it is thriving. But it's more than a new building we're dedicating today. In reality, we are solemnly in the presence of our Commander-in-Chief reaffirming the club's traditional adherence to that triad of virtues on which our nation was founded and now depends, reverence, patriotism, and service. These attributes may be fading, sir, in some places, but they're not fading in this teepee on Farragut Square. For more than a century, generations of Army and Navy Club members have answered their nation's call, shouldered arms, and march toward the sound of enemy guns. And between such times, club members gathered here, retold and refought battles, all of which were undoubtedly the better and the more exciting for the retelling. This great club has been figuratively and most certainly literally a refreshing oasis 
where generations of our members have rested on their long trek to their Valhalla. It is for these uh, reasons, Mr. President, that we are so deeply honored with your presence here today. In being with us, you are continuing a treasured tradition of this club. We could not have had a real opening without you. However, the role of our nation's president is not limited to a few occasions in a century. It's a tradition of the club that all of our official dinners are open with a standing toast to the President of the United States. And now, as you may suspect, Mr. President, you're among friends. Through the years of your presidency, Army and Navy Club members have applauded and supported your leadership. We have seen and appreciated your determined and successful efforts to restore our nation's military might and with it a renewed respect for our nation throughout the world. You have reinvigorated the spirit of patriotism and our citizens everywhere again can exclaim with pride, I am an American. As those who have served, we know too that the indispensable ingredient of military strength are people. And we know too how much you have done to restore the prestige of the military uniform and how much you have done to better the lives of those who wear it. This morning, we thank you for honoring the Army and Navy Club with your presence. And we salute you in a spirit of sincere admiration and respect. Ladies and gentlemen, the serviceman's friend, our Commander in Chief, the President of the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much. Reverend Clergy, General Hiddle, General Dawson, Charles Graham, ladies and gentlemen, in the old days, I'm told, the Army and Navy Club often invited their neighbor, the President, to all their parties. I've also heard that Benjamin Harrison and Grover Cleveland walked over for a toddy or two. Oh, for the good old days. <laughs> if I had known that the club was this beautiful, Nancy and I would have stopped by long ago. And uh, we would even walk if the Secret Service would let us. Well, the word for today is congratulations. You've put together a beautiful building and an historic treasure. I'm amazed at your outstanding collection of art, particularly the de Weldon sculptures. I've always wondered where old generals and admirals went when they just faded away, and now I know. But nothing is more important than keeping alive the gallant tradition of our armed services, a tradition that adds up to a word not just for today, but for all time, patriotism. As you know, I've visited our men and women in the armed services and their families all around the world, from Camp Liberty Bell on the demilitarized zone in Korea to Tempelhof Air Force Base in West Berlin. And the one thing that's always struck me the most about them is their dedication to country. They take a little bit of America with them every place they go, no matter how far, to make it more like home. And these men and women are willing to be away from this home that they love so that other countries may remain free. That's one of the great sacrifices they make for our country. So I've got a report to bring you from the front. I've talked to admirals and generals alike on bases from Iceland to Guam, and they've told me stories about how their troops, U.S. troops, are the best trained, best equipped, and best educated troops around. To sum it up, what we have right now is the best darn group of young men and women in uniform that this nation has ever seen, and we're proud of them. I was honored when you invited me to dedicate your new clubhouse as the Army and Navy Club begins its second century. General Hiddle assures me that I'm among friends. Then I knew that already. No group of men and women has given more steadfast support to the Commander-in-Chief, no matter what his name was, no matter what party he represented. And I know I'll never forget the support that you've given me during some of my toughest hours as President. 
And so I salute you, not only for the help you've given me over the past seven years, but for the help your club has given my predecessors and will give my successors for generations to come. Upstairs, I couldn't help noticing the busts of President Eisenhower and President Truman. But when I saw that picture of General Hap Arnold standing in front of a B-17, I had to resist the urge to snap to attention. You know, General Arnold was my boss some 40 years ago, and he ran a tough Air Force. Just ask the fellows on the other side. General Hiddle told me, too, that Gary Cooper filmed many of the scenes of the Billy Mitchell court-martial right here at the club. But he says that the members wouldn't let the cameras in until after midnight, after the members had gone to bed. Well, I'm grateful that you didn't impose that kind of schedule on me. <laughs> uh, and I think Nancy would feel the same way. In December of 1985, according to your records, after the founders signed the papers of incorporation, they retired to a warm room to drink a toast to the club. I'd like to repeat that salute with you today. For a century, the Army and Navy Club has played an important role in the life of the Republic. May the second century eclipse the first. And so, ladies and gentlemen, a salute to the club. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. This re and reaffirms, I think, what you knew and it was superfluous for me to tell you that you're among friends. And now, in the tradition of dedicating ceremonies such as this, it is my privilege at this time to present the Army and Navy Club flag to our general manager, Mr. Charles Graham. to you, I charge that you see that it is flown promptly, proudly, and properly over the Army and Navy Club. And I have one admonition for you. Please make sure you never have to fly it upside down. <laughs> Mr. President, the presentation of the club flag does not com quite complete the program. There is a glaring omission that must be remedied here and now. Each of the former presidents, Benjamin Harrison and William Howard Taft, who participated in dedicating the two previous Army and Navy clubhouses, did so in full status as club members. Because of your kindness in being with us and because of our appreciation and affection for you. We want you to be as fully accredited as those former presidents. And accordingly, it's my privilege on behalf of the Board of Governors to present to you an honorary life membership in the Army and Navy Club. We hope you will in the years to come enjoy, as have so many former presidents, this great old club which you have so honored today. And your membership. At this time, Major General Gerald Marsh, Chaplain, United States Air Force, will now pronounce the benediction. Let us pray. Almighty God, again we pause to express our gratitude to you for the marvelous gifts with which you have blessed us, for this facility, its staff, its members and supporters, we are grateful. May reverence, patriotism, and service 
truly characterize all that which is conducted in this place. May the sanctuary and recreation experienced here enable many to attain higher degrees of effectiveness in their personal and professional responsibilities. As we enjoy the fruits of freedom and success, remind us of our need to care for those about us whose lives have not been filled with such manifold blessings. Especially, we pray for those who lack freedom and who live under oppression. We pray that you will grant a special measure of your wisdom and strength to our president and to all who serve our nation in positions of authority and trust. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might, great God our King, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining in the dedication of this rebuilt home of the Army and Navy Club. Mr. President, I know I speak for all our members throughout the world. Thank you for honoring this club by your participation in these ceremonies. This completes the dedication program. One more announcement, you are all invited to the open house that begins promptly. <laughs>